So I'm going to speak about my ideas, my experience, and where I think Gen AI is going to make a massive difference, where I think it can be used, where I think it shouldn't be used, and, and throw a whole bunch of concepts and ideas to you, and also real life examples of the stuff that I've been doing. So I've, I kind of have to say that OWASP is very dear to my heart, right? OWASP started with me replying to a guy, other crazy dude called Mark Curfew online, where I said, hey, I'm doing some cool research on .NET. He said, come along. Long story short, I started to be involved. I did a lot of stuff. I was part of, I would say, the first real generation of OWASP sort of leaders that were thinking globally. I was on the board. I started lots of projects, met lots of you, lots of amazing places, amazing venues. And, and I think OWASP is a great example of a community that you want to be part of. You want to be involved. It's, you know, it's very easy to, to get in. It's easy to be involved. Just, you know, again, assume everybody has a great intention. Sometimes it, it feels dysfunctional, but every company is dysfunctional, the organization. But it's an amazing environment to be in. And the, the, the recommendation I would say to a lot of people who are, you know, on, on your career is, what I've done was I waited until I was quite old to go into executive positions, right? And I think that's quite important because it meant that by the time I arrived there, and I think I have you know, a reasonable successful career in the UK, CISO of a number of organizations, I grew teams from two to 20, managed you know, multi-million pound budgets, you know, then a, lot, a huge great innovation. But by the time I got there, I felt I was kind of hacking the organization now from the inside. It was really cool. And, and the nice thing that happens when you're senior right, and experienced is you control your time. You think you don't, you do. All you have to do is delegate, right? So I became very good at delegating and then working technical hands-on. So you know, I have to say I'm still very technical. I still program. As you'll see, I still build a lot of stuff. And I think that's very important because I, I think if you don't program, if you don't know how things really work, you struggle with certain of the concepts. You know? On the other hand, there's space on cybersecurity for everybody. So there's room for everybody. We need as many people as we can get. We need as many more people to come in. And I was going to say in a bit, I think the world really needs AppSec. I think up until now, the world got away without it, right? You know, some places they use it, other places they was like, roll the dice, Whee, it's great, we haven't been hacked, right? But I think that's going to change, right? Quite uh, all that. So kind of evolve, I'm doing a Gen AI company. I, I, I'm actually a chief scientist for a tech startup. We kind of make a bunch of stuff part-time. Oh, that's my job part-time, <laughs> not the company. Uh, it's really cool, uh, you know, what we do there. I do a lot of open source development. In fact, I actually think I'm probably one of the biggest OWASP code contributors, right? If you look at my repos, the stuff I do. Although, my biggest project, which I'm going to show, is not an OWASP project because I didn't update the README, right? So if you guys want to participate in OWASP projects, join this one because I think there's a crazy amount of good stuff flying around. And I do this thing on the Open Security Summit, which, by the way, I kind of started because I wanted to do a lot of summits, and there was a, a, a bit of a, a fork in a little bit, but the great news is OWASP now is going to do summits again, right? Woo! So in, Sept in uh, November, right, in the UK, we're going to do another one of the summits, and then hopefully a lot more to come. Uh, oh, Seba's there. There you go. One of the <laughs> key players in the summit, so it's going to be really cool. Right. So, and by the way, I kind of did this, and then, you know, halfway through, I felt, well, that's kind of, you know, it's a bit presumptuous, right? But, but I have to say that I'm proud of every single one of them, right? You know, okay, the keynote speech is, you know, is, is, is not that relevant, but, you know, I've been a leader, I've been a member, I've mentored a lot of people, uh, actually some, I think, in this room, uh, and then, you know, I'm a defender, I'm a breaker, I'm a builder, and I'm a developer. And I actually think you need to do all of that, right? I don't think you can defend if you can't break. I think if you defend, you know, if you break but don't know how to defend, you don't understand the thing. So it's kind of, you need a bit of everything, right? Because you get a better perspective, perspective of everything. And you need to be a developer even more these days, right? And then, you know, and management culture, right? Managing, you know, it's like hacking just different kind of metrics, right? And different parameters. But it's still very cool. So I'm going to focus on Gen AI, right? In fact, more and more, okay, I'm going to be politically correct here, right? And I know there's some people who work on this stuff. I'm sorry. But there's a lot of models that people are creating that for me are like blockchain, right? You know, and like, and sort of, you know, and quantum is that when people explain the use case, they're going, you know, I kind of get it, but I can do that much better with some hashes and some workflows and, and clean up the data, 
right? So I think a lot of the training models, and I, I'm these days really against training models, right? They, they're trying to solve a problem that you should solve different ways, right? And I think if you do need the speed, then you're talking about machine learning, not Gen AI. And Gen AI is different. It's different because there's an air gap, literally, between the input and the output. So I think there's a lot of space for machine learning. We've been doing that for a long time. There's a lot of space for deep learning. I think Gen AI, you know, we have to treat it a little bit different because it's, it's definitely new on this. So my presentation is about deterministic Gen AI outputs with provenance. So it's important to go through, through this in, in detail, right? So deterministic is repeatable, consistent, audible, predictable, and reliable. Right? When we program, that's what we want, right? Code has this really interesting property that although, yes, there's bugs, there's a lot of problems, it actually is quite deterministic once we understand it, right? Now, we, we don't always understand how our software works, but um, the reality is code is very deterministic in a way, and especially when it works once, it tends to work consistently, right? And in fact, we build entire infrastructures and companies and, and environments on top of it, right? So I think deterministic is very important, right? And when I develop, right, like, I, I go over every little detail that I don't understand. Like, it freaks me out when there's something that happens that I can't track, I can't replicate, all that stuff. So you need to live in the deterministic world, right? Gen AI is this, I would say, the new generation of AI models that ChatGPT really brought, but it's been gone for a while, but it's a different one. It's one that generates content. Now, I, I think the people that says Gen AI is just predictive output are doing a disservice, right? I actually would argue that it has logic, it has reasoning, it has a huge amount of understanding of how things work. It's not conscious, of course, right? It's still, you know, ultimately an algorithm running, right? But what's very interesting is that we still don't know how it works, right? And the best understanding that I've heard is that the Gen AI creates a, a model of the world of whatever question you're doing, you're asking, and then it answers based on that. That's why it translates language very well, because it's just a model, and then he understands the relationship between everything, right? So it's generative text and images. So the output is what gets created, right? It's what, literally what we give to the users, right? And provenance... It's, it's actually one of the things that I actually feel OWASP has to absolutely be a massive player because OWASP will be one of the sources of trustworthy information, knowledge, and, and content, right? So we need to have provenance. We need to understand how the hell we arrive at this decision, how the hell we arrive there. So we need to be able to track it back. And what's interesting is that when you track it back and you hit an LLM, then you can't continue because we don't know how we got there. We don't know how it works. We don't know the sources of it, right? And there's an argument that says that we might never know because of the way it actually has been designed in the first place, right? So, here's a question. If you guys can go to uh, menti.com, be cool, right? And you use that code, A2946749. And I would like you guys to answer the question, what is the sixth most powerful programming language in the world, right? You know, there's a lot of languages in the world, right? So, you know, so basically, pro, you know, talk about programming languages. Come on, guys, give me some answers here, right? So it's 8294-6749, right? So, so when, when you think of programming languages, right, and, and, and the power of it, like, which one do you think kind of roughly on the sixth, right, uh, slot uh, these days? Right, okay, you got Excel, VB, B, Beams, COBOL. By the way, if you want to make money, learn COBOL, by the way. Like, best, best way to be highly employable, right? Cool, you got Java, JavaScript, Rust. Rust is a great language, by the way, right? Um, oh, there's Python there, which I kind of agree. Python probably is higher than sixth, right? So, cool, right, so let's see. So there's two in there that are going on the right track, but I think there's only two. I think there's a misspelling of it, right? Very cool, guys. So that's kind of what I was expecting, right? Really cool sort of uh, version of it, right? So here's the interesting thing, right? The interesting thing is that basically the... Actually, there you go. That's the quiz, right? Because data is now code, right? And Gen AI prompts are literally natural languages, right? The actual sixth most powerful programming language in the world is actually Portuguese. Which is fucking awesome, right? 
Isn't that fucking cool, right? See? So we, right, as we are native speakers, right, at least for the native speakers here, although if you speak Portuguese, that counts too, right? We know how to program in the sixth most powerful language in the world right now, right, which is Portuguese, right, in terms of, in terms of size, you know, there's a lot of people saying this, right, English is a new coding language, right, you know, hard as a new programming language is English, right, and I kind of agree with that, right, because Portuguese, you know, as English, right, you know, and every other language in the world, dead or alive, and this is very interesting, there's a lot of amazing case studies of languages coming back from the dead, company, communities really leveraging this to learn and to be, make language much more effective, right, they can be used to give instructions to LLM. Because you have to remember that, actually from a security point of view, with LLMs, we're going backward two decades, right? It's like we spent all this time trying to separate code and data, and now freaking data is code, right? And there's no way around it, right? Even when you try to segment it, there's, there's always stuff in there, right? Which is kind of why I'm saying injections, you know, it's probably not really a solvable problem at the moment, right? So, Okay, there's 266 million first language Portuguese, right? Right, unspoken with ninth place, right? Because English actually is at the top, right? But actually, you know, ninth place with 257 million speakers, that is pretty cool, right? And, um, and actually, there's a lot of programmers, right? <laughs> you know, out there. And, um, and, and I actually think that, you know, Portugal is an interesting country, right? And I think, you know, some comes on the, on the, peri on less, you know, like outside of UK and America and some of the big players. I think they have a great opportunity to really be a massive player. I think they have a great opportunity to not miss this next revolution. And it's going to make a massive difference. And in a way, you are part of it, right? You need to, to really accelerate because, in a way, the future of Portugal kind of depends on you, right? And I think it really can make a massive difference, right? But we need to get it right or else, you know, Portugal becomes just another consumer of global technology, right? Which is not where it should be because now we actually have the ability to set difference. So my, my view is that Gen AI is the next major technological revolution. It, and this is, even this is doing a disservice, right? It's not just a, a major. It's, it's much bigger than the previous ones, right? We had big transformations, but Gen AI, it's, it's, it's a bit like imagine if AOL had won, right? No, there was no really internet, you know, and suddenly at the same time you had broadband, mobile, and, and the cloud arriving at the same time, right? So imagine the disruption that would happen on this. Right? And I think that's kind of what's happening at the moment here. And, and yes, there's going to be a bust. I'm going to talk about it. But I think the reason why it's so powerful, right, it's not because it can create content. And I think it's easy to look at that. And I think most people in talk hallucinations will talk about that. Right? And it's, it's kind of like we invented Jarvis, like Iron Man, and then we complain that Jarvis is bad at, po you know, is bad at like making shit up and all that kind of stuff. Where actually, it's an insane co-pilot, it's an insane helper, it's an insane reviewer, and that's what it is. Because for the first time, you have a bit of technology that can actually understand content, can actually understand things. We never had that before. We always had to code it, which is why it never really scales, right? And in a weird way, hallucinations, and whoever came up with that name deserves a price because it kind of saved the industry for a little bit, right? Because it's really making up shit, lying, you know, like, come on. It's, it's a nice word, right? Um, it's a feature when you want creative stuff. It's a bug when you want deterministic. And by the way, our software hallucinates too, right? We call them bugs and security issues, but you know, like somebody was mentioning log4j, you know, the vulnerability, right? Look, the fact that freaking something, a logger can do remote code execution, that's, that's hallucination code style, right? So, you know, we have that problem. And in fact, most software, nobody understands how it works. Right, because most software, the people who program are long gone, right? The new crowd's like, ooh, I don't know how this works. There's no documentation, right? So, you know, half the world runs on top of that, right? So, key question. Is it secure, right? But it's secure and it's safe. And I tend to use this word secure and safe a little bit, you know, quite uniquely because security is about the security properties of something, right? So you, 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 you can measure security, right? Security is like, do you have security features? Do you have X, Y, Z, right? You can argue that a house with machine guns outside of it with weapons and guards and all that stuff has a lot of security features, right? It's probably secure. It's very hard to get in, right? Is it safe? Most likely not. Is that where you want your kids to grow? Most likely not, right? So, you know, it's important to distinguish this and it's important to have context, right? I always tell the boards when they, when they ask, are we secure? I says, no. That's not the point. In fact, we're not, right? The question is, are we safe? And they say, well, that's a much more interesting conversation to answer, right? So, is AI secure? No, 
right? Like, like not even by a freaking long shot, right? And, and in fact, I'm going to talk about how it's, not, it's ridiculously dangerous, the API. It's going to be your most crazy insider threat once it starts to pop, right? Is it safe? Well, I think maybe, right? I think it depends on the implementation. And I'm going to show a couple of case studies of how to do it, right? So I want to walk you through kind of a way of visualizing the LLMs, which hopefully will, will dis distill a little bit the magic, because there's still a lot of magic behind the scenes, right? How does it work? What does it do, et cetera, right? So let me show you in action. So I've been working on this thing, which I call Cyber Boardroom. It's my, my project. I open source most of the stuff. Everything I'm going to show you here is on that GitHub repo, is on PyPy, is on Docker Hub, right? Everything you're going to see now here. And in fact, this is what I've been spending the last two months on. Right? And I would argue that anybody here that is developing anything, any product, bu building a really effective DevOps pipeline, even from a security point of view, is probably the single most important thing you should do. And you should not stop until you have something like this. What's cool about this is I can now make a code change that runs my unit tests, right? There's tagging, and that's very important, right? So every single major and minor release I tag. So I have literally tags in Git, left, right, and center. I publish to PyPy. I publish to Docker Hub. I create AWS AMIs. I publish to EC2. I publish to GCP. I trigger another set of custom versions. I go to AWS Lambda, and I publish to ECS task. And I'm able to deploy this application you're going to see, which, again, you can run from your laptop, completely isolated. And, and even offline, now that you've got models like Olama and others, which you know, allows you to, sorry, providers of Olama that allows you to run models like Meta and the others, right? You can literally run the whole thing offline. And that's literally, for me, the best way to have a secure app, right? The best way to have a secure app is not to care about the security of it, right? It's because you put it in an environment, right, that security vulnerabilities don't matter. Right? So I'll give an example. Like, I was in a dinner with a bunch of, you know, <laughs> the sisters, and there was this guy, you know, like, we talk about solo wins and all that stuff, right? And the dude just, you know, when he says, look, we, I couldn't give, sh you know, I didn't care about solo wins. You know, you guys know solo wins, right? You know, probably some of you had problems with it, massive backdoor on, on the commercial software, right? The guy said, I didn't care. I heard about it. I turned off my computer. I just figured out. I went home. I didn't, I didn't do anything about solo wins. And we had, they had massive solo wins. Because you know what they did? Something very simple, right? They didn't allow their solo wins to go to the internet. Because why the hell should that thing go to the internet? Right? Why should the application you deploy in your data center be able to connect anywhere apart from where they really need to? Right? So that was a great example, right, of building environments that you can then run, isolate, and then do. So what I'm doing with this is I'm basically allowing now this solution to be deployed anywhere. Right? And that's very important. You get a lot of security in the back of it. Because suddenly, you know, even if there's, for example, security vulnerabilities on this application, if you deploy in a completely air-gapped environment, it doesn't matter. Right? That's the bottom line, right? And that's the thing that a lot of the vendors and a lot of the people who try to sell security solutions, they don't get, is that you have to answer the question, so what? The context. Why does it matter? I don't care about vulnerability. I care about the impact. In fact, I, I didn't have it here, but there's a really cool concept called the minimal viable company, right? Which is this idea that you should know what parts of the company you should leave intact if there's a massive thing. So I had a breach once in, in one of my teams, and they went and fixed the problem, and at the end I says, you should have not run there. You should have run over there, because that's our most important assets. I could, I could afford that to all burn down, right? Yes, it's problematic. It's not a pain. If that thing got hit, we should be defending this, not that, right? So again, you need to understand this. You need to have context on this. And this DevOps pipeline is interesting because it was really like, it, you know, it, it's now was personal to me, right? I could say, I want to, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm going to look for funding. I want features because of that. And I literally spent two months building a CI pipeline. And I remember once arguing with a, another security a peer because he said, I have this budget. Where should I put my money in? Yada, yada, yada. And I said, you know what you should do? You should fund the CI pipeline of the developers. Because without that CI pipeline, it doesn't matter what tooling you get. It's not going to go anywhere. So I think that is the most important security feature that you can have, right? What happens, you know, that's all my AMIs. Look, it's just created now for, for breakfast. I don't care. And literally, I deployed to production with a change of AMI. It's a really sweet solution, right? You have a global load balancer. You have regional load balancers. You have an auto-scaling group. You have an AMI, which is a copy of an image. And that's it. 
And this thing will scale now until AWS breaks. Right? What you have to do is you have to solve state and secrets, which you should anyway, right? And then lots of little things break, but once you dealt with it, it's really freaking robust. And that means that every one of those is an isolated release of this application. Every single one of them, right? Which is really cool. And that thing runs, right, on a laptop, on a, on a Docker container, on an, a raw EC2 image with systemd, runs in Kubernetes, right, and runs in massive scale. Because it's just live for bits, right? Once you've done that, it's always the same. So it's really cool, right? And then you get all that bit. So the challenge I'm trying to solve, which is a challenge that I think everybody you know, deals with it in some ways, is how do you scale risk management in context, right? Because you know, when, when you do this at a certain senior level, you, you kind of do this in, in, independently, but you need to be able to, we need to be able to do this at scale. And that's where we really failed in security, right? We really failed in security because, we know, and by the way, like, we are some of the most important people in the company, like, just to be clear, right? Like, we are the only department in the company that has access to everything, speaks to everybody, has good relationships with everybody, has actually a mandate that is not that political, which is, you know, freaking keep our customers or our business sort of drivers safe, right? We have a larger than life mission and we save the freaking day, right? That's pretty cool, right? There's not a lot of departments that can say that, right? And actually, a lot of times we are shrinks, right? Like in incidents, sometimes, you know, I had like three departments and oh, you know, we just had to get them together and they freaking get, didn't, didn't get along, right? I'm like, dude, come on, like at least for this, right? But at least you build relationships, right? So it's really cool, right, to do that. But my challenge was always how to scale risk management, how to scale, I have this nugget, I have this thing, right, that I want to, um, to do, how do I really allow the business to make good decisions, right? And it's not that I didn't have access to the board, it's not that I didn't have access to the, the things, it's just I couldn't scale. Because if I went to my team and said, guys, I, I kind of want daily, weekly reports, and I don't, I don't want just one, I need 25 or 50 reports, you, could, you, know, you can see where they sent me to, right? Nobody would do it, and they don't do it, right? Because it didn't scale, right? But I think now we can, because the thing about this is when you talk about briefing somebody, right? It's very important that we understand what that means, right? If you're briefing an individual, you have to brief the individual in their language, in their culture, with whatever knowledge they have, in the state they're in, because it changes, right? And they need to allow them to have questions. Now, in the past, this was an app. This was a graph, but it never really scaled, right? But what's cool about it, and this is where I think the LLMs are amazing, is they allow us to do this. So the problem I'm trying to solve here, and you can get rid of the cyber boardroom and you, you have the same challenge anywhere, is how do you communicate with stakeholders? Use their language, culture, knowledge, state, interests, and level of ownership. And it's, level of ownership is also important, right? Do they care or they don't care, right? What are they vested, right? So in a way, it's about doing this kind of stuff, right? So, so basically, I build this thing, which you can use. So let's take it for a spin, right? So I'm going to try. I have the screenshots, but let's see if I can do a live demo, right? Always... Always interesting, right? So this is the, here's my AMI being deployed, right? Really cool, right? You guys can come here. So this is sort of the, a bit of the Athena part where he kind of uses OpenAI, but the, the thing that's interesting is this part here, right? So, so I'm gonna come in here and uh, I'm gonna give you a little demo, right? So I'm gonna say, okay, I say hi, all nice and good. So I'm gonna say my name is John. Actually, let me just change provider to Meta. So, by the way, it's really cool. Uh, also, if you guys don't know what those are, that's Grok with a Q, which is a very clever play. A company they're doing microprocessors, so they give you LLM stuff for free because they're playing with it. But they, I think, they have a great play. They stay, they're basically saying we're better than Nvidia at inference, and they really are super freaking fast. You got Open Router that gives you access to all the other ones really, really nicely. Again, you have Bedrock and the players, but I really like Open Router. You have Alama, which is freaking cool. So when I run this in my laptop, I can run this on the plane. I can run this offline. It's freaking awesome, right? It's a bit slow these days, but but it's already doable, right? It's good for tasks that don't require inter interactive, and then OpenAI is the player, right? So you can see, look, I say hi there, nice to meet you, right? Uh, what's up, right? So I can now say, let's say two, let's say what is two plus two, right? And you get and so it's four, and I can say, can you add, uh, add more to make it 42, because it's always 42, and can you reply with my name, right? Cool, right, so 
what you have here is actually almost like this is the, 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 the key part of the play, right? So if you look at my last answer, I can say, can you add it to make it 42? I didn't say what was the last number, right? I didn't say that you were at four, right? So he remember the last number, he learned, right? <laughs> you know, and he remember my name. Woo, how cool is that, right? Now, the question is, how did this happen? Right? How did he went? And when you think about machine, you know, people training models, it's kind of like they want to train him also, so this knowledge is baked in, right? The problem I have with that is I don't understand how he learns, so that I, I don't know how to debug it, and I don't know how to tweak it, and good luck doing erasures, right, on that data when you train a model. But the question is, how do you do this, right? So one of the coolest features that I've added here, and by the way, this is all open source, you guys can play with it, is that I add that edit button, right? Which I think is quite unique. I haven't seen that anywhere, right? And what that edit button allows me to do is to come in here, right, and say, actually, my name is actually Dennis, right? So, so, what, so what's going to happen is I can now say, right, um, uh, are you sure you got right my name right? And in fact, we could also change the sum. So let's do this. So say, actually, let's see then if we add 138 more, it makes 42, right? And you sure you got my name? And the sum right. Right? So, so what, what I'm doing here, right? I'm changing the data that is sent to the provider, right? ChatGPT, you know, in this case, Meta, Lama, et cetera, right? So what you can see here, it goes, oh, sorry about the mistake, right? You told me, right? Here's what you need to understand, right? You told me that my name is Dennis, right? Because the whole context of that question here is what it was sent. That I just edit, right? And then, you know, I go, I need more, less, and I start for the confusion. Let's try again, right? And then, you know, and actually, this is quite interesting, right? Because you actually still make a mistake, right? Can you see that? And if you had 138 more, that makes 4 plus 138. So that's hallucination. Sorry? Oh, you're right. My name and the right, ah, okay. Let's try, let's try that again. Cool. Although, to be honest, he's still hallucinated, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, but we, look, we try this again, right? It's quite cool, right? So, my name is John. Oops. It's John. All right, All right. What is two plus two plus three, right? Add 242 and say my name, right? So there you go, right? And, uh, oh, your name. Oh, I, you know why? Yeah, you guys know why, why I did this? It's because Google Jammer 2 doesn't do a good job remembering, right? Where if I now flick, and the other thing that's really cool is, can you see that little thing there at the bottom, right? I can flick now the, between the different versions, which is actually really freaking cool, right? So I can now say, uh, try again, right? And, and now it's gonna say, I apologize for the mistake. Right, for the, and your name is John, right? So you can see the other one was done by Google Gemini. This is done Google by Meta Lama 3, right? So, um, and then I can say the same thing. I can say, my name is Dennis. And then I go, are you sure about my name? Right? And he's going to go, apologize, your name is Dennis. Right? The thing that I really want you to understand is like, this is how LLMs work. There's no black magic behind the scenes, right? In fact, I think OpenAI does a disservice because they kind of hide this from you. In fact, what they don't show you is how much they are compressing the conversations in between, right? Because the thing I've learned with this is that you don't send your entire history every time because that gets exponentially, right? And it gets very expensive. Right? So this is very important that, you know, you understand that the model just sees whatever is on that prompt. The coolest thing is that you can create entire realities in that. And that's what I'm saying. It's all about that prompt. It's all about finding the models and then you provide the information on it. That's how it works, right? And this is, I think, is a good example of how you can edit and play around with it and really manipulate it, right? And understand how it goes, right? So, um, cool. So basically, so now, so that worked, always good, right? Um, so now, 
you know, start saying the name, simple follow questions, edit the history, see what happens, cool. Now, you can speak multiple languages, right? So here's the coolest thing, right? So one of the things you can do, right, is you can make it speak in different language, right? So here it is, right? So I, and now, what I want you to understand here is that the bit in black at the top, right? The bit in black is all I had to do, that little bit there, right? Is all I had to do, right, in the data that you send to the LLM. So when you send to the LLMs, you fundamentally send what's called a system prompt, which still has a little bit of power. It's not, you know, always enforced, but system prompt. Then you have the history. I was called, you know, the conversations you had, and then you have your prompt, right? Literally, that's what you send. And you can manipulate all of it, right? Every, like I was just showing before. So just by saying, only speaking Portuguese, only speaking French, only speaking that, the same question is now answered in, in these languages, right? Uh, so basically, you know, what is OWASP, you know, oh, sorry, now it is, right? Uh, there you go, right? OWASP this, OWASP says, OWASP is a non-profit, right? See? So, so what's really cool about this is that that's all it takes. So if you think about like even OWASP as an organization, right? OWASP needs to speak now, like every language in the book, right? And we need, you now need to be multilingual from the ground up. Now, it doesn't mean this is 100% perfect, and that's why we need to start to have better models. That's why even in Portugal, we should invest in freaking models that speak our language better, because I actually don't think, even ChatGPT actually speaks Brazilian Portuguese. Not that's a bad thing, but in fact, we need Portuguese from Portugal, Portuguese from Angola, Portuguese from Mozambique, Portuguese from Cape Verde, from, from everyone of our dialects, right? You know, it'd be cool to actually have Portuguese from Alentejo, right? From, from, from the Algarve, right? From Azores, right? Like, we, I never understand those guys, right? Like, so, it's just fine. It's, I think it's great. Those cultures are great, right? So we should have that, right? We should preserve it, right? And, and it should have that level of quality on it. And that's really important, right? But, and this thing that you see here is this ability to translate is what I think it gets really interesting, right? Because this is where the LLMs are really, really good at, right? Like, for example, here's six languages, right? Here is OASP, right, in six different languages, right? In fact, the most popular, right? So you've got English, Mandarin, Hindi, Bengali, Russian, and Portuguese, right? And so basically, we should be speaking every single language. Every content in OAS should be translated and verified and maintained in every single language that exists. In the past, we couldn't scale this because we couldn't scale the delta. Now we can, right? But here's the coolest thing, right? Because talk about different languages, right? Communicating with execs is like speaking a different language, right? So, so what we want to do here is that, uh, and I have the execs here, right? So let's talk to free board members, right? So what I've done here was I, I kind of created an environment. This is what I'm, again, I'm playing with the cyber boardroom, but again, it's, it's, it's nothing there, right? It's like, you guys need to start replicating this in your own environment. So I said, here's the board member with a CFO, right? It says, act like a board member that has legal responsibility for the company, reply in one paragraph, and you focus, and you are focused on finance things, you have no experience with cybersecurity, right? And then you ask the, the kind of question that, you know, I, I, some, a lot of security executives ask, is, hey man, I'd like 250K budget to replace our SIM, so I improve our SOAR capabilities and deal with APT more, more effectively, right? So you can see how that flies with the executives, right? And what's interesting about this is you can see, you know, a CFO going, hey, I don't understand the scope of this, what the hell are you talking about? A quarter of a million dollars is a significant expenditure. This one here, right, is kind of operational. So I understand the importance of doing that. So I said, he has some experience in cybersecurity, right? And then the one on the right said again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the HR person, right? Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand clear this, what you're asking for as a board member. Yeah, the other, what we are doing, right? So, so basically, and you know, and you can ask all sorts of questions, right? You know, you, you can say, you know, do you care about cybersecurity? Uh, care about, Yeah, I can misspell it, sorry. And, uh, and you will basically, you know, to be honest, I don't understand. As a board member of operation capabilities, to be honest, I don't understand the intricate, right? Now, this is still very polite, right? This is being, um, kind of quite politically correct on the answers. In the real world, what you tend to have is actually this. So you have three exec personas. So what I've done here was I basically said, the first one, is a CFO that doesn't have a lot of patience. 
the, the, the second exec is a CRO who actually hired a CISO. And by the way, that happened to me twice. I, I met two different execs, and they basically turned to me and says, hi, you, you owe your job to me because I was a board member. I arrived here, and I said, dude, where's your security team? <laughs> it's like, you need to get one. So, uh, And then the last one is the HR person who is jaded and sarcastic about security and doesn't like that guy, right? So this is the real world. Right? This is what happens, right? Now it gets interesting, right? Now you got the CFO going, I have no patience. Look, I don't have to understand what SOAR and APT means. I don't care about the technical details. What I care is the bottom line. What kind of financial returns can I expect on this investment? That's exactly the kind of question you have to answer with everything you guys do, right? And now you can start to translate it, right? The one in the middle says, CISO, who hired him, by the way, so it's a bit friendly, trying to mentor. Look, I appreciate your enthusiasm, right? But, you know, let's, um, let's a board member approach responsibilities, I need to see the bigger picture, right? And then the jaded guy is going, hey, another tech bro coming with me, a bunch of acronyms and expecting you to fork a quarter million dollars without breaking a set, right? So this is kind of like, to us, I quite like this humor. I think it's quite funny, right, to see like the, the humor side of things. And even when sometimes they don't say this, this is exactly what they're thinking, right? So, so what you have here is you can now start to map out the personality. You start to map out, you know, what, what's happening, how to communicate, what better to understand. And the thing I'm doing with the boardroom, which is the cyber boardroom, is I'm trying to do the reverse of this. I'm also trying to allow them to ask questions, and then the questions come back to you, right? Because the thing that's going to be interesting, and, and by the way, right, this is coming your way, whether you get prepared or not, right, is that you can then take, oh yeah, so one more thing. So then I, what I also did was, I, I said, ask the same question to the LLM, so what you have here, and this is the final kind of workflow, is, and this is the, the minimum you should be doing with LLMs, is this workflow that you ask the same question to free LLMs, and then you ask them to verify, Right? That is the way you really want to do it, right? One LLM is not good enough. In fact, there's a, a, two great analogies, right? One of them is the divers, right? If you look at divers, when they go to, down to um, deep dive, they take three watches, right? Because one is not enough. If it breaks, you might die. If you have two watches, you don't know which one's right. So you take three, right? If they're all the same, okay. And actually, the, 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 the people doing space, uh, you know, microchips do the same thing. SpaceX, they have three microchips. Right? They, they basically send the same instruction to three processors. If they all result in the same result, cool. Then you continue. So it's really powerful to do this. And this is the minimum you should be doing. And it's ridiculously powerful, right? So if I come in and here and say, what is OWASP? Right? Reply in this. Then it gives you, you know, an explanation. And then you can say, cool. Now act like a content reviewer with super focus on detail and review the results. So now you can see, and this is what I mean by the prompt, right? What, I, what you're going to see here in blue is everything that the fourth LLM received, right? So the fourth LLM received my prompt, the answer from chatbot one, right? The answer from chatbot two, right? The answer from three, and then it gives you an analysis. And you can kind of do this four or five times. You can say, well, is that analysis correct, right? Until you reach the status of conclusion, right? You can even go from one, three, one, three, one, you know, you can play around with this. And the reason why now the LLMs are free or close to free, this scales really nicely, right? So it's really, really powerful. But the problem with this, right, is that the LLMs hallucinate. And by the way, where they, I, I don't know why, but um, with, with me, they hallucinate pretty spectacularly, right? So whenever I do this, right, I get some ridiculous answers, right? So it kind of gets some OWASP, right? So, so in this one, he says, oh, I wrote the testing guide, the replicate security center, right? And uh, uh, I spoke a black hat, and now I haven't. I have RSA. Oh, no, this one gets to go to platform. This one goes completely off piece, right? Right? Graduated with a degree, University of Brasilia. Right, there you go, right? And, uh, and then you go like that, start a security professional. So again, so I can then ask the, 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 the other model, right, to say, and you can see, right? Verify, verify, like, like this, right? And he, and he, he gives me an accuracy. But the problem here is the, 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 the fourth LLM is still comparing with his own set of data. And, and I don't want that. See, I don't want LLMs to bring any data with them because I don't know where it came from. So where it gets really interesting is when you do this, right? So when you do this is when you basically bas take, so this is now my LinkedIn data. Right, so I'm going to ask the same question again. Right, it's going to hallucinate again. Right, and now I'm a CEO of Chain Pass, rock and roll. Right, and then, but now I'm going to say, right, here is, I think I got it there. Right, so, so basically I'm saying, here is, oops, sorry, here is 
this LinkedIn page. Here's the content. So here's your source of truth, right? Now review it, right? And this is literally what you guys should be doing, right? So, so, so you can see this part here, look, experience, this is this bit here is my source of truth, right? All of that. And then starts the chatbot, the reviews from each one, and then it keeps going. And, and the coolest thing is the prompt size you can see is big enough to hold this. Then you got a decent review, right? So now you can see inconsistencies, inaccuracies, etc. right? Now, the thing about this, and this is what I'm saying, that you want to bring your own content, right? You want to bring your own uh, information because you want to make sure you can debug everything. So I don't want my models to bring anything. Right? I want to have, I want, I want to have a complete debuggability. If you think about this, I can track back every single problem, every single analysis, because I got all the history and all the analysis of all the threats. So that's really what you guys should be doing. So, in a nutshell, right, that's, that, that covers the patterns, right? So, so there's a thing, bring your own content, you know, who's me, let's review it, right? And, um, yeah, and again, final thing, right? So this again, this is coming your way, right? So this is me taking one of those dashboards, you know, this is like the, the sort of the cyber board room, which I, I, I tweak it, I think it to be a bit funny, right? And I says, what the hell is this, right? And then he gives me a decent answer. And then I could say, I'm a CISO, can you give me the email to send to my CISO? So I say, I'm acting as a board member, give me the email to send my CISO to ask him questions about that thing, right? So this is kind of, a, you know, I think it's going to be great, because I think we're going to get a lot more accountability, but you're going to get much better questions and answers from the other execs, because they can play the game too, right? right? So, um, so it's quite interesting. So, going back to deterministic general output with provenance, right? And uh, Matt, I got 15 minutes, right? Cool, right. So, this is what I, I think is interesting, right? So, and I show a bunch of patterns there. What, the reason why I'm, I'm also doing that, you can see that I'm introducing like air gaps in the system, and they are very important, because in a way, there's, it's super powerful at translating content, but it's very ridiculously dangerous, dangerous in the way it operates normally. Because in a weird way, the, the, the Gen AI is your most formal API, because it's an API, and it's your most dangerous inside the threat. Because can you imagine when those things start to get popped? Like, we still don't know what a buffer overflow, a really buffer overflow looks like for a Gen AI model. There could be models that have already been poisoned for a long time, and they have back doors, they have all sorts of crazy stuff, right? So that's why, again, you want three different things, you want things in place uh, in there, right? Because on the reverse side of this, what I like about Gen AI is not, is, is, is not a technology that just brings problems, is that I think for the first time, we have a technology that allows us to understand reality, so we can understand exactly what's happening in our networks, in our applications, in our organizations, etc. allows us to automate a lot of stuff, allows to personalize comms, and more importantly, personalized learning, so we can create really effective learnings, and we, we can 10x more productive. So the only people that are interested in, in getting rid of jobs are the same people that have always done that, the same crowd that outsourced everything to other countries, the same crowd that wants to drive the cost to the bottom. Those are not the interesting people for you to work for, and they are not also, I think, in the future, the ones that are going to be very successful, right? The same way the outsourcing came back, right? Because it didn't really work that effectively, right? The, the thing about this is, you know, good programming, good logic, good people, we've never been in more demand, and we're going to need even more, because now that we can automate a lot of tasks, means that stuff are going to go out of control even more than, you know, they used to go, right? So it's a massive opportunity for business. Of course, it's also a massive threat, right? The, if you guys want to take some principles for how to do it safely, this is my recommendation. You start with read-only models, like right? don't have a model that learn. That's not your job. You know, unless you have 200 million in the bank, right? You should be doing that game, right? And if you if you want anything to learn, do machine learning, don't do Gen AI, right? Uh, it's all about the prompts, and you can see the space, the demos I showed you. You bring your own content, and once you bring your own content, you control it. That's normal AppSec, normal engineering. Right, And then uh, you have to also assume that every content and prompts that you put into the LLM are exposed, which is why you only want to allow the person that has that content to access that LLM that has their content, because then you don't have that problem. Right, And you need to double down on AppSec and Cyber, because I think we, we, we know what we're doing and this stuff. So, recapping, Gen AI is really bad at explain how the, the output was created, and it's also very bad at self-awareness. You can see how I was manipulating the reality of the LLM, just by changing the history of what was in there, right? They're not aware of it. But it's very good at understanding and connecting data, and it's very good at personalizing and customizing data. That's where you should be focusing. That's the wins. And in cybersecurity, we have so many tools, so many processes, so many things that 
we need to do. And, and, and more importantly, what I found was that there's a moment in cybersecurity where you hit the business, right? And it's always a very interesting moment because there's a moment where you can do a lot of your stuff, you're in your bubble, but there's a moment where you cannot change the security posture of the business without changing the business itself. And that's when I realized that we were in a game of changing the business. We were in a game of almost helping the business to help themselves, right? So they can develop things securely, they can implement things securely, they can build stuff like that because that's kind of how we operate, right? And the, the key here is you have to have this human ownership of the answers, right? The idea that you just get the AIs to automate stuff, you know, how can that go wrong, right? It's, it's going to be a massive problem more and more, right? Because people are connecting stuff. So you need that human ownership, that common sense. But also we can now bring common sense to some of our apps using, again, gen AIs to analyze things and to allow things to occur much more effectively, right? And it's going to change everything. There's going to be some massive crashes, as always, but I think we can finally tackle those issues without too much code. And it's the perfect time, right? So it's right, you know, the, 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 the boat hasn't sailed completely. You can still jump on board. I think it's a great time to really start to be involved. And again, OWASP is an amazing organization to do that, right? I think it's a great hotbed of creativity, of innovation, of, of people that care about this stuff. I, I think the, the percentage of people that care about making the world a better place is kind of higher at OWASP, which I think is quite cool, right? Especially, you know, the more you get involved, you know, people really care, so it's a great place to be. But don't miss it, right? Because, you know, this is going to be another major revolution, right? So I, I have some slides here. You can see this, right? This is just, you know, why some companies panic, Microsoft's doing a great job, and all these guys, right? Uh, this is kind of the picture that changed my life because I, I realized that the, the original is, the, the square is the original, the rest is the augmented, so you have to imagine the mental model that the, the LLMs have to do in order to create that, and you apply that to text, right? So, again, that's Mona Lisa, that's, you know, Metallica on a cake, but that's just you know, whatever you can do with it, right? But that was the moment I realized that the, the, the mental model that the LLMs can create is something quite remarkable, right? And we need to understand more, which is really cool, right? So, I kind of talked about these patterns, you know, I showed you the examples, the one that I I think is very interesting is when you ask multiple questions, more interesting when you do this. So this is the exact, exact thing I showed you. You take a question, you go to three LLMs, you put it to the fourth, and then you use that to consolidate the answer. In fact, what you really should do is this, where you get another one, and you ask the question, is that, is that a good answer? Is that a good consolidation? Is the user okay? Can you also create a, a consent? Can you create mapping? Is that malicious, etc.? What's cool about this is it becomes harder and harder and harder to compromise. You're putting air gaps in the middle of this, right? Which is really, really interesting, right? You start to limit the, the, the access, especially if all of this is now version controlled and you, you, you track all of it, right? And all, just to be on the rags, a lot of people are doing rag stuff. I'm still very skeptical because it's, a lot of it is black magic. I, I still don't buy it. I think the stuff that's with graphs is a lot more interesting, right? I think you, you take the content, you summarize, you summarize, you build graphs of it, and then you navigate the graph. I think that will give you much better, again, deterministic and provenance of where the data came from. Right? Or else you go, oh yeah, it came from that vector. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> How the hell did that vector came about, right? So, you know, I, I think you want to have that provenance. You want to have that connection with the data. And that's super important, right? So, very quickly, right? You don't want to do this. Input, Gen AI black box solution, right? Which seems to be a lot of solutions out there, right? You kind of want to do this, where you do app second prompt engineering at the gate, right? Then you have the black box, and you, and you should view that thing as your most hostile, which is kind of what I was saying, that you want to have a pipeline like the one I created, which is like completely isolated. And and, and, and the guy who did the keynote in the morning had a good point. Like there's a lot of these models that the data goes in and, the, and it ends up kind of half, half, you know, around the world. We, you really want to segment that thing. And that's where you need good AppSec, good InfoSec, good security practices, because you need to contain it, right? Then you have a solution, they have human verification, human ownership. It doesn't mean that the human ownership is all, the, all, all time there, but it's part of the original loop. Then you scale, like we do with software, right? And remember that that's your most vulnerable API, it's also your most dangerous inside a threat. Can you imagine when somebody pops an LLM that is in the middle of your application, and it's not like SQL injection where you still have to do a bunch of stuff and extract data? It's like, hey, can you hack the organization from the inside, 
right? Can you start to list what's going on? Can you package the data? Can you imagine the kind of exploits you're going to have when you're dealing with the LLM, not a SQL database or whatever that, that thing you happen to land on, right? So don't do the stuff at the top. Do AppSec and Cyber, which means what we do is even, even more important. And I think now we can scale very effectively, right? And what you really, really don't want to do <laughs> is take that freaking black box that we still don't know how it works, and you plug it to your cloud environment, to your corporate environment, and your customer environment, right? Now, this is one of those, like, what can go wrong, right, with this, right? And this is what a lot of people are doing, right? So, you know, and that's what I'm saying. Like, if that's what's on the thread model, then you're in for a freaking surprise, right? And, you know, and I, that's why you can contain it. If you view that thing as isolated, you learn the models, it's completely locked, and then you do it like that, right? And then you, and you want news uh, loops, and then every time there's a little thing you don't understand, you trigger an incident, you map it out, and then you, you bring it back to normal, right? So I was going to dive some principles. The one, okay, the one, I, this, this is a really good one to mention, my party trick. Use P3s as training, run them as P1s, best way to learn things, right? I always view that the job is to take risks, right? And I really like this idea that you want the business to operate at the speed of customer experience and accept the risk appetite, which actually means that our job is to let the business operate securely. Right? Like, we have to stop this freaking idea that it's the user's problem to click on things. That's how the freaking thing works, right? It's not their job. It's not the job of the business. The job of the business is to operate at the speed and the risk that they're comfortable with. In fact, we need to let them operate securely, right? Because in a way, that's actually a good canaries and alarm bells, right? You know, defense. What you don't want is allow a little compromise over here to blow up your half your company. That's the problem you want to tackle. So if you, I, I like this idea that you almost, it, but here's the thing, right? You need to allow a situation where the users will be compromised, but you, you want to have minimum zero impact, right? Because you cannot have it both ways, right? And I think it's a much more healthy way of looking at the problem. So I highly recommend that. So we talk about protecting. The main thing I want to show here, the OWASP top 10, the way I look at it, if you do all of this, then the only thing that is important is prop injection. So I disagree. There was a guy who did a session earlier who said prop injection is solvable. I don't think we're even close to do that. Until we can separate properly the code and data, I'm really worried that, you know, the, the exploits are ridiculous, right? Because freaking data is code, right? Everything else, right, it's, you have to assume the stuff, it's model responsibility, and then it's AppSec, right? So, you know, I think it's important that the really new thing, if you're doing the stuff on the left, if you're doing, if you have models and building all that stuff, then yeah, then you have to care about all of that, right? So, um, you know, again, right, super important, OWASP and AppSec, they never be more important, right? And needed, right? And I think uh, you should be involved and ride this wave, right? And you know, sort of like my, my last sort of comments on this, right? I, I think we we are at a time where, you know, our generation is going to. Ha and, and by the way, by my by our generation, actually, I mean all the generations that are now involved in, right? And I think it's really cool that we're in an industry where, I guess, the, the ones that are older, like you know, I see some faces here, we are still super excited about this. Right? And the new generation still has a lot to do, right? There's other industries, right? The new generation, by the time they arrive, is like, dude, we've done it all, right? And others where the new generation has everything and the old generation has nothing, right? So I think it's really cool that we, we need, we have space for everybody. We need, you know, a lot of people in our culture. One of the things I try to do a lot, and you should try to do this, is we need to bring a lot more people from other industries into our industry, right? And there's this thing called imposter syndrome, which a lot of people have. There's also this thing called trespasser syndrome, which people don't think they should be in there, and I think that we finally, I think we have a way to solve this, the knowledge transfer gap that we have, which is using the LLMs to learn. That was the only thing I, I couldn't do in the past very effectively. We, I, you know, I hired in my team, I had a guy that was on a shop floor that was hacking, we hired him, a guy from the warehouse that was running some hacking tools, we hired him, I got a guy from, from, from the, a, a manager of a store, I have another people from project management and the instance response, I had the dude that was on a call center that was dealing with the, with the incidents, he was really pissed off with all the guys abusing our customers, we put them in leading our fraud, managing Splunk, right? You know, it, Yes, I think there's a great amount of talent that we can bring to our industry, and, and again, that increased diversity of everything, but we need to make it much better ways to learn, right? And I think it's a great moment, and I feel, you know, this is a great time to be, but the, the, the things we do in the next decades, or in the next five years, are going to make a massive difference. So, you know, I, I do think that the whole deep fakes and the whole bad stuff, you know, is going to go up a level. I do think that it's going to be good, because it's going to force us to, to solve the provenance problem. 
right? It's going to solve this. You're going to force to say where that information came from. Like, how do I know this person is actually that person? How do I know who, who is who what? And where does the data come from? And I think solving that problem will make us, our society, and what we do way, way better, right? And, you know, the place to do that is the OS, right? So, you know, be involved, you know, come to the, to the summit that we're going to do in November, right? In, um, in London, right? And, uh, you know, I, I hope you, you participate and, and, and and uh, the play around with my th this thing here that I was basically doing, which is there, right? So there you go. Play with the cyber boardroom. You can go online. You can run it locally. Go to the clouds, right? And uh, and give me feedback. And right on time.